when we think about K through 20 and doing federated identity management, I'm curious what's stopping us, what's holding us up. We've had a lot of discussions in Texas. Sadly, that's all we've had in, uh, with K through 12 at least is conversations. And so uh, I just want to know what out there are the stumbling blocks. I don't think my, uh, mine is really an answer to your question. It's really more a question. When you've had your conversations with the K-12 community in particular, what kind of applications do they see uh, this federation identity management system working for them in that environment? Yeah, okay. three, uh, content. Uh, I know MCNC is uh, uh, controlling uh, licensed PBS content. I'm sorry. Uh, content is one of the things I've heard. Uh, MCNC is, is licensing PBS content, but using federation to control access to that restricted content. Uh, repositories is another one. Um, I'm sure there are several others that I'm not aware of. Yes, video. Yes. Uh, that was a, st Anne mentioned a statewide video portal. This would again be for educational content, I'm, I'm presuming. Yeah. Okay, New Jersey Edge. Okay. Okay, then I'll ask my question. Um, what would be required for a school district or a school system? Would they have to have an affinity relationship with the university that has this, or do you see them implementing this within their own uh, district and unit? Be able to answer. Well, I think the overall question is where are the federation boundaries falling, uh, specifically with K through 12? And I think anybody that would give you a hard and fast answer uh, and say federation boundaries should be here. Um, is probably not thinking it out clearly. So I think we'll see a variety of different things. Uh, personally in Texas, I think LEARN uh, would be all too eager to step up and say, let's start doing some stuff in the K-12 through space. Uh, it would be a little bit unconventional for LEARN to step into the K-12 through space, but it is something I know for a fact they are eager in doing. So I think your, your, RON, your RON, your regional optical networks, are going to start stepping up and forming these federations. Uh, there may be, uh, like in North Carolina, where it's a state-based uh, federation, again, brought by the RON. So to me, that seems to be an emerging front is, is uh, states are getting together and forming these. Uh, because obviously, if K-12 through is left to, to do it on its own, that's an awful lot of work. Uh, and it's really repetitive work that's already been done. So uh, that's where I see the affiliations falling. But there, it's going to be a mixed bag. You really answered my question because I, I understand the applications piece, but I remember when within our own state uh, at the uh, Department of Ed conversations around it, it was really for student record retention following students when they were leaving one school district to go to another school district. And, and so it was really student records as well as applications. Any other questions? Yes. I guess I'll, I'll ask a generic one. And um, you, you responded, Paul, talking about the federation boundaries. But I guess the question on my mind was specifically about the identity provider piece, which is still fairly cumbersome for most people to, to set up. And particularly if I think about small schools, um, it's, it's hard for me to imagine them uh, acquiring the technology and, and deploying it to, to run an IDP. So you got multiple suggestions for that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, there's some work being done in hosted IDPs. Um, I think we're getting the shibboleth uh, installation process much, much less painful than it was. There's a quick install now for Windows. Um, I know some folks that have got it real scripted where you just answer a few questions and it goes off and does its thing. Um, it's a completely unrelated project in the state of Texas, but there's an app that's being rolled out for police officers across the state. The intention is to, you, to you know, have an IDP at every police department in the state of Texas. Well, as is true in Alaska, I'm sure there are some very small police departments that might have a police car and uh, might have two police officers and uh, certainly nobody technical. So uh, they are going to need some help and I think it's going to be incumbent on <laughs> folks like that are in this room to, to, to help with that. But there are moves afoot and Ann has something I'm sure much more meaningful to say than... <laughs>
Ann, go ahead. And Claire, if you have anything to say, just pipe in, okay? Ann's going to speak. Will. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what Paul said. Um, there is a program through the Incumbent Federation called the Incumbent Affiliates, which are, uh, in essence, uh, um, corporate partners who are offering services to institutions, organizations that want to get up and running in Incumbent and, frankly, in Federation in general, um, but aren't interested in doing it themselves. We have consultants there. We have an outsourced IDP there. We have... Uh, federated appliances and what's happening, uh, from my understanding, if there's anyone here from North Carolina, I don't know. No, oh, okay. Is they're looking at a number of different, and I think actually Ornet is doing a, a similar thing. They're looking at um, analyzing and, and a number of these different offerings and kind of saying, you know, here's the gamut, here's here's a recommended set of solutions that you can use. I know that at least uh, the appliance folks are very interested in working with K-12 on this. So um, I think we're early uh, a little bit, but I think what's good about that is there are a lot of uh, companies interested in working with folks. So. Yeah. Paul, you mentioned some weeks ago a an appliance vendor that had come to see you. Did, wasn't that an IDP? Is that glue or Aegis? Uh, it's probably glue. Fifteen right down the road from us. Okay. G L U U dot org. Right, and they're an affiliate to glue. Oh, that's right. They are an affiliate. Yes, they are. Um, and since I'm not on mic, I can say anything, right? Yeah. Now, um, uh, there's also uh, protectnetwork.org has got a public IDP, but they also say they will do hosted ID identity providers also for those who don't want to run their own. So there's. There's a set of solutions today, and it's a growing set of solutions uh, to address this problem. It's not there yet. I, Anne's right. We're early, but it's coming around. Okay. Any other questions? Early. That's interesting. Um, how early are we, For, especially in the K-12 sector? Well, I think um, in terms of the, the K-12 sector, I think uh, Claire hit it on the head in terms of policy. I think uh, the policy space between higher education and K-12 is going to be pretty different, uh, in particular with including, say, parental access on uh, the release of attributes about their kids. So uh, the information that's released about, say, a fifth grader is probably going to be different than that released about a 12th grader, and the parental invo involvement in that will probably be different. Right now, we don't have a lot of um, mechanisms to, to enable that. So in that way, I think it's early. So, And that's uh, actually both a technology issue and probably a policy issue, both. I'm going to reference, um, again, the state when I said there was early conversation around this. Uh, what raised its head immediately was FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so when you're working with the K-12, anytime you're discussing maintaining student records and transferring student records, that fear that the information will get into the wrong hands, the uncertainty of what's going to happen with that, and the doubt that it will be secure is always a major consideration. So it's two to I agree with you, Anne. It's two totally different environments when you're talking um, identity management in those two different environments. And I would just say that what we're talking about here is not things like the SIF standard, you know, which is transfer of academic uh, information. It's more information about access. So it's not an entire record. It's uh, done usually under contractual, obliga uh, contractual consent. Um, and uh, it's a an piece of information or a couple pieces of information that is passed only for access control decisions. So it's not a whole slew of information that's necessarily passed. You can, but typically that's not what's happening. So I, I would add one completely technical thing is that, you know, you, you probably look at 10, 15 years ago LDAP deployment in K-12, and it was largely non-existent. Once 
it became quote unquote mainstream. And what I'm really meaning here is once you can go down to your computer store and buy Microsoft Windows and it comes with LDAP, people started deploying it. So once that same Microsoft DVD has SAML capabilities in it, that technically opens the door to federation to where the FUD factor when you're saying, oh, come download this open source software that you don't know anything about and we promise we'll help you configure it and uh, you know we promise we'll help you live with it moving forward. I think when the when the big players start coming out with those tools, a lot of them are already out there. Oracle has has good tools, RSA and others, but uh, Microsoft obviously is the big big player there. And I look at a lot of the K through 12 schools, and they've managed to get Active Directory up and running, which is LDAP. And so I think the same will be true for for SAML as well. Okay, Denise. Carol. Uh, yes. One other comment. I think that while the the FUD is real, I don't. I don't want to um, try to minimize it. But what's going on in terms of accountability these days is going to actually break down some of those barriers. In the last legislative session in Texas, there was proposed in a, a bill, which didn't make it out of committee, for a single student system for all of K through 12 and higher education in the state of Texas. Um, if they really want to get to where do K through 12 students move around within the system and where do uh, higher ed students move around and what is the real success in degrees and so on, those measurements that we use but we know aren't entirely accurate about getting knowing what actually happened to what the student's course was to get from point A to point B. Uh, we're going to see more suggestions like that, and they'll either become um, choices we make ourselves to make those things happen, or they will, in fact, become law, and we'll get to do it that way. First of all, I'm going to say, Claire, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.